lovely, lovely imps and future YouTube imps. It's wonderful to see you today. Today, I am going to be doing a sort of free form um, review. This is live, but when you're watching it, it probably won't be live anymore. Um, review of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, an absolutely awesome anime that I am, that's like, it came out a while ago. I'm, I'm a little behind on it, but I think that it is fair to call Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood a classic, and I want to tell you why. Um, so first off, the first part of this review um, is mostly going to be my general thoughts on the, the on the series, some of the more um, specific critiques, whereas the second half is going to have spoilers. The first half will not have any spoilers. The second half will have spoilers and is going to uh, be a longer form discussion of all the stuff that's that's going to happen. Um, yes, and like Silent says, if you are listening. Do what this comment says right here. There you go. That will. That's how I. I know that you're a true fan. Um. Yeah. Um. So. Let's begin without any further ado. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is a. Uh. I think can be fairly described as a shonen anime, which means it's uh got a lot of actions. The protagonists are uh you know teenage boys, and it's sort of on the surface pitched at being a show largely targeted and, and marketed towards teenage boys though i don't think at all that's what the show really is um most shonens in my opinion are a little bit shallow a little bit focused on the combat on the fighting on the big explosions on the immediate drama and while that certainly does exist in full metal alchemist brotherhood there is a lot more to this show that really makes it stick and be enjoyable even for politically minded adults such as the imps most of the imps some of you are probably kids and whatnot but that's fine full metal alchemist brotherhood has fantastic animation all the way through the show and the uh and uh and it also has a really really great voice acting in both the sub and the dub um, I usually watch most anime. I will watch subtitled because I like the original voice acting in most shows. However, there are some shows where for one reason or another, either because it's a very long show that I'm going to be watching while I do other things, I will watch dubs. And I have to say the dubs for um, Full Metal Alchemist were actually good. We're actually really, really good. Um, uh, a lot of times dubs, especially um, ones unfortunately by companies like Funimation don't really have a very good reputation, but I do believe that this particular show has really, really good dubs. Um, and I was able to enjoy it despite being pretty, um, you know, pretty critical of that sort of thing. Um, so let me give you the general, the general pitch for what Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is the second Full Metal Alchemist, um, animated series that has ever existed there is an a a uh, full metal alchemist um anime that was made i believe starting in 2003 um that uh is actually quite good as well although i haven't seen the entire thing um oh yeah i of course i'm not too afraid to invoke the name of, of funimation it's it's well known there are criticisms of funimation and all and all that and that's fine we're not really going to talk about that much here um if at all um, but, uh, yeah, there are, there are two full metal animes. The first one is, uh, is full metal alchemist, not brotherhood. We're talking about full metal alchemist brotherhood. The first show, um, was made when the, the manga, the original full metal alchemist manga was not yet complete. And so they eventually caught up with the manga and had to sort of write their own story. And a lot of people really like it, um, but it goes in a very different direction than the manga and also just a very different direction in general. A lot of people still like it. I haven't seen it yet. I intend to watch it and review it in the future. But Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood was made after the 
uh, and the original manga was completed and follows the plot of the original manga. Um, yeah, I think it's fair. A lot of people would say something similar. There are two alternative timelines, which is interesting for sure. Um, and we're talking about, of course, Brotherhood today, which is, uh, came out, um, off the top of my head, I can't even think of the date. Um, this is why I said it's freeform. I'm a streamer. I'm not a, I'm not a, don't do the prepared YouTube stuff usually. Um, this show came out in 2009. It was two, it was, uh, mid 2009 is when Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, um, came out. Um, and the show follows, um, two, uh, uh, two young men uh, from the from the country of a mistress. The best way to think about a mistress and to understand the uh, the the sort of setting is a mistress is like a uh, early to mid nineteen uh, hundreds uh, Germany. Very similar. Uh, everything from um, the level of industry to the technological level to the aesthetics is very very reminiscent of like mid century or early 19, 19, or, uh, eight, uh, 1900s Germany. Um, and there are two uh, main characters, um, uh, Edward Elric and Alphonse Elric. Um, they are skilled alchemists. And in this world, an alchemist is could be basically understood as a scientist. Um, although they use like, powers that are like in our world would be considered magical alchemy is not really magic per se uh it follows very strict rules that have to be studied and uh are scientifically documented so it is a different world than ours but it has pretty rigid rules um and uh and these two alchemists are very very talented um edward elric is uh edward elric is the full metal alchemist um and you will discover he is the powerhouse of talent of the two brothers he's the older brother and uh and was uh given a his his approval to become a state alchemist for a mistress at a very young age um and as a result being a state alchemist in this world gives you a lot of leeway now you are ultimately um, uh, you are ultimately at the behest of the military, but in times of peace, um, you are basically allowed to go research. You're given a stipend to go figure out stuff, learn stuff about alchemy, to grow the knowledge, to do research and development, to help out the people, um, of, of the country, et cetera, et cetera. You may, as a, as a state alchemist, be called upon by the state to do some state official things. Um, there are state alchemists sometimes are literally like laborers, like they'll be called in to fix buildings that have been damaged and a whole lot more. Now, something that you'll learn very quickly about, uh, Ed, about Ed and Alphonse, the two main characters, is that they are physically very different from everyone around them. Edward is missing two limbs his arm and his leg, both of which have been replaced with prosthetics. And Alphonse, well, Alphonse is missing his entire body. Alphonse is a moving, a moving uh, golem of armor. He's giant. And it is a little funny because he's not the full metal alchemist. But you'll understand that when you watch the series. Okay, so that's the setup. You've got two state alchemists going about to try and learn and solve their personal problems at first. From there, it branches into a sprawling adventure with all kinds of really wonderful side characters, a, a really intense story that's got a little bit of like a, a whole lot of mystery, a bunch of political intrigue. There's battles and there's war. There's there's horrible secret uh science experiments oh is al not actually a state alchemist i thought Al was but whatever maybe not <laughs> edward is 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 uh is on the shorter side of things but that's okay that's okay that's all right oh i didn't okay i i, I forgot about that 
uh, I forgot that Al was technically too young to become a state alchemist. That's fine. He nonetheless has, he knows how to use alchemy. And uh, this show has a really, really good pace. The one thing that I really loved, it is a bit of a long show. I think it's five seasons with quite a few episodes, um, um, you know, uh, within each each season. And the show has a really, really good pace. It starts, um, you know, it starts with a lot of like sort of personal stories of them trying to deal with things that happen in their adventures across the land and some weird mysteries pop up. Um, but uh, it expands well beyond to a point where you get to a like epic proportions. And I don't just mean like epic battles. Once again, it's not just about epic battles. There's not just like charging a giant bomb that's going to blow up the whole planet. No, there's multiple storylines that are taking place in different areas. And this show really, really, um, uh, this, this show really, really does a, uh, a good job. Um, uh, the show does a really good job keeping them together and keeping you hooked in. And uh, throughout the story, you there's all kinds of little personal messages. There's all kinds of little deep and um, and and uh, insightful moments. And the cool thing that I like about most, or one of the things I like most about Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, is that it doesn't shy away from tough philosophical questions. Okay, it really doesn't. Um, it, 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 even though it's a show that is ostensibly a shonen with a lot of action and sort of teenage pr protagonists who are hotheads and, you know, they're like, ah, I want to fight. Ah, and they've got some of those anime, the things, you know, you, everybody knows and loves about shonen. It really doesn't shy away from much bigger questions. And I appreciated getting to watch it at this point in my life because even though it's not about, it was not made during this current political climate or... Uh, even any, you know, even close to it, really. Uh, the original series was, you know, made, was finished quite a while ago. It manages to predict and discuss a lot of similar issues um, to what we have going on all across the world right now. And I think that's pretty cool. When a show manages to become timeless with its political commentary, I think that's valuable. I, I really think that's valuable. Um, and... Uh, it does a really good job at representing diversity of ideology, which is cool as hell, if you ask me, because a lot of shows never really do that. A lot of shows um, just kind of give you what you're supposed to believe and who you're supposed to root for and whatnot. And of course, there are protagonists. There is people you got to root for, kind of. But... Um, this show does a good job of exploring how different people view and and maneuver politics very differently. And another thing that's really great about this show is that it manages to discuss a a a message that that could just be in any other show, friendship is awesome and amazing and powerful without it just becoming trite. The message about friendship, about camaraderie, about togetherness, about working together, about all of these things, um, is delivered in a in a really potent manner that I think, again, makes it unique um, among you know many other anime like it. Um, and another thing that it does that's really great is it actually is really good about queer things and sex work and arguably even sexuality and gender, which is wild because that is really rare to find in media at all, let alone media that's over a decade old. And that's kind of awesome. And I really really appreciate it and we're going to talk about that in the second portion if you want to know more about it because i being queer myself being a trans person myself uh found that to be really inspiring and awesome 
Um, oh, we'll talk about it. Don't you worry. Stick around. We're going to talk about it. Um, as for some of the themes, as the show goes on, the themes do become um, quite mature. Um, not like sexually or anything like that. It doesn't really touch on that too much. Um, but it does touch on uh, war. It touches on genocide. It touches on atrocities. It touches on being a soldier. It talks. It touches on being a part of a machine that is bigger than you that you can't personally uh, necessarily immediately affect, or at least you might not know how to. And it talks about power and how you wield power and how you prevent power from going wrong. And it's really cool in that way because um, power is often taken for granted in anime. Um, not all anime, but in a lot of anime, especially shonens. Um, power is a, a abstract, um, th you could shoot bigger energy balls or you could punch harder. In this show, that is not how they handle power at all. And they deal with power in a way that I think that most younger folks watching the show won't necessarily pick up on, but people who are a little more politically minded will. And I think that's really, really cool. So from here on out, we're going to be, you know, I'm just going to give you my final word on why I recommend it, because I think this is a pretty convincing pitch for most of you to go watch the show and really, really enjoy it. And then afterwards, we're going to go into a detailed discussion in which I... Um, there's going to be spoilers during that part. So you could pause and stop or whatever right after this next line before I start the next part, okay? You should watch it. I highly, highly recommend Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. One of my favorite anime uh, series I've I've ever watched. It has really stuck with me. And I'm, <laughs> I feel kind of bad that I, that it took me so long to actually see it. You should go see it, especially, especially if you consider yourself a fan of anime, which I do like anime a lot. Um, and uh, you should go watch it. You should go watch it as soon as you can because it's a classic, in my opinion. It's right up there alongside Evangelion, Death Note, and the other classics. And oddly enough, I, I, find, I found out that less people seem to have seen it than those. But we can hopefully change that. Go see Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. You will have a good time. It is through and through a great a great show with awesome characters. The plot lines are well done. They're they're clean. They're they don't feel super disorganized, and uh and it's very easy to follow and enjoy. And you will find yourself wanting to watch more and more episodes. I am very picky about media. If something does, if I don't like something, I don't stick with it longer than uh than I feel in inspired to do so. And I'm also. Uh, I also don't watch a whole lot of, like, TV shows and stuff because I have ADHD, and it's hard for me to sit down and watch a lot of stuff. But this show, I watched the whole thing, and I wanted to keep watching every episode. So I really, really hope that you will go and consider watching Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood because it fucking slaps, okay? So from here on out, everything here is going to be very free form, full of spoilers. So stop here if you want to go watch the show. But if you want to hear more about my thoughts on the show and all my reviews and everything like that, um, we're going to do that right now. And of course, just so you know, this is going to be a lot more free form. This is more of like a discussion with me and chat. And uh, I'm still going to post it as a review because I feel like people really like that type of thing. Yeah. So, um, sick. Let's begin with the spoiler segment. Woo! I think, by the way, just so you know, I think, uh, oh yeah, and I should say, uh, before we get into this, even if you know the spoilers, the show is still really awesome to watch. It is not a show that relies on, like, twists as the main sell selling point. Of course, all stories are fun when you don't know what's gonna happen, um, but... It's not a show where if you know the spoilers, it's going to ruin the experience of the show. Um, oh, v VM Draco, I hope you have a great night. And um, if you 
if you want to come back after this, we're not going to go for too, too long. There's going to be more content afterwards, most likely. So, um, let's continue with that in mind. If you hear spoilers, it's not going to ruin the show for you. Yeah, you probably will forget them. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about it. So, I had a whole bunch of notes that I took down for us to discuss. Um, yes, the boy's master. Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, maybe. I do think, Hexagram, I do think there are some spoilers. There are some types of shows that are, uh, that are, that rely a little more on twists and stuff like that. So, I, I don't know. Maybe. I, I think, LSM, I think you're, I think in general that's true. I think if the only thing in a show is twists, by the way, that's something that a lot of modern shows rely on. They rely on shocking twists that you could never predict, like Lost, that are not satisfying. That is not FMAB. Um, I do believe there are shows that suck to have spoilers revealed, um, particularly mystery shows, like shows that are like crime related, because the fun is the is in in like figuring is trying to figure out the crime alongside the characters. Um, but but I do generally agree that if like a show is spoiled by just spoilers, that makes you know that's got a lot of of uh, of troubles, you know. Um, Horton Horton saves the who's yes how long do I think this segment will be probably about 30 minutes to an hour maybe I don't know we'll see um you can just mute it and then ask people in chat if it's done yet but it, but it won't be too long Kimberly all right so let's talk about the real nitty-gritty of the show okay so one of the things I brought up in the first part of my uh is it a must watch yes I believe it's a must watch yes I think it's a must watch. If you like, if you like, you got to see it. It's fucking good. It's really, really good. Especially if you're a lefty. There you go. There's a, here's the lefty takes. This show is so, uh, it is such a lefty vibe. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Um, yeah, that's totally fair. Um, this is a, this show is a lefty vibe. I can tell you that much. Now, is it, it is, it's not going to hit you over the head with it, but one of the core things that I loved and that I mentioned in the first part of the review is that it is a socially minded show. And when I say it's socially minded, you might think something like, oh, you mean like power of friendship? Well, there's a little bit of that. Not much to be fair, but there's a little bit. What I mean is that this, sh this show, while having main characters, it never really feels like the main characters are the only characters. They never feel like they're the only main characters. In fact, like, I I can't even, like, some of the characters that would technically be side characters are, are so important that the show wouldn't even stand if they were removed. There is an, 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 a, a synergy among the characters of this show that is just so fantastic. And it is hard for a lot of sh series to match it. Nearly every character that you will meet is really fucking important. And I love that. I love that there isn't this sort of uh, very blinkered fixation on the great men um, of, of the series. And in fact, it, it literally pushes you to, to, um, to you know, think of uh, the other people involved. And one of the cool things is that there are multiple points in the story where the party splits. The main characters go different directions and different things happen and it still stays good. It stays really good. And that is awesome. Um, now, it doesn't really do any major, um, you know, uh, it doesn't really do any major time skips. There's a couple of little time skips and those time skips skip for everyone which is pretty cool yeah despite being the main protagonist um uh Ed edward and alphonse quickly learn their small fish in a very large and sprawling world that's true um that is true so there the show is super socially minded and we're going to talk about a couple specific examples of this um you know as the review goes on another thing that i wanted to touch on too um is that this show really does a good job with diversity and cultural sensitivity. And I don't mean that in the, 
you know, sort of manufactured way that we've come to understand the Disney diversity where there's one of everybody or anything like that. It's nothing like that. In f this show, um, while it's not perfect, um, this show has every character in this show is super, super different. And, and, and to a degree that like their storylines, the ways that they view the world is totally different. And what's better is that the show really makes you get into their heads, even of characters that you fucking hate. It really makes you try to see the world the way they see the world. Almost such that if you stepped into their shoes, you might feel like you'd make the exact same decisions they would. And that's kind of a wild thing to accomplish. Because, you know, most of the time you kind of just write off the people who don't agree with you in a lot of shows because, you know, that's how they're written. They're not really written to get you. Well, I could talk about that. We can talk about that in the specific part. We'll get one second. And then there was another thing I mentioned in the beginning about using power responsibility, checking power, seeding power, uh, and, and never underestimating power. Um, because, and this is central to the show, in a, in a world where there's a lot of different types of power, um, the one thing this show makes abundantly clear is that political power trumps everything. And this is a show where there's literal magical abilities. People can, can well, I mean, magical. There, there's a whole system for it. But anyway, they can do incredible things. They can summon a, a statue out of the ground before your eyes. They can fix something instantly by slapping their hands together. Something like that. Um, and But the power that matters in the show is political power. And political power is carried through people. And that, and you can't skip that step. You cannot skip that step, and that is a huge part of the show. In fact, arguably, it is the, the, the main message of the ending of the show. Again, we're in the spoilers section, so at the end of the show, the villain, the main villain, uh, a, a, a incomplete uh, being known as the the homunculus the the homunculus in the flask the the demon in the flask the um the the dwarf in the flask that has a bunch of different names depending on the translation um the uh he's a little originally was a small little dust cloud with a, a smiling face and an eye um but one of his main things also known as father yes he's also called father by many characters um the lesson that he is sort of confronted with at the very tail end of the story is not that, you know, he was, you know, oh, you were too powerful or you you were too greedy and you took all the power for yourself, but rather that he ignored everything that is necessary to, to justify and balance and check power. There's another character who is um, the unexpected... Uh, foil to the main villain and a lot of people would be like oh well surely it must be um you know alphonse and Ed edward and alphonse oh or maybe it's hohenheim hohenheim literally looks exact he's literally the, the 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 dwarf in the flask makes a clone of hohenheim's body and takes it for himself so you would think oh these guys are got have got to be uh you know have got to be foils for one another I propose a different solution. A character by the name of Roy Mustang is the actual main foil for the main villain. And that's because the way that each of them wields power is completely and utterly different. Greed is really interesting. Um, we're going to get to that too. Um, Roy Mustang is a soldier. Roy Mustang is a skilled practitioner, the last remaining practitioner of um, of fire alchemy, a uh, very difficult art to master that has been essentially erased from the world. And as the show goes on, it is determined why that's the case. Because fire alchemy is can be pretty bad. Fire is scary. A lot of people forget this, but... Like, fire is 
power is unbelievably powerful. Um, for those who don't know, uh, for a long bit of until very recently in history, most structures were made out of wood, and people die really easily and really painfully from fire. Um, Fire is the ultimate consumptive force in the world in a lot of ways, at least mental, at least symbolically. Um, there are entire cities that have uh, burnt down in places that you wouldn't even imagine. Like I learned about that the hometown that I, the, the town that I grew up in, I didn't even know this until I was much older, but just a century before had burned to the ground all of the buildings and it had to be totally rebuilt at the turn of the century which is wild and they couldn't stop it no humans could stop it you think it's easy to put a uh, fire out mm, no it's not no um not not at all um it's actually really really difficult and roy mustang uh being a practitioner of of fire alchemy you know was invited in and succeeded very, uh, you know, succeeded in the military as a state alchemist very, very well. And eventually, during war, was uh, ordered to commit genocide alongside every other state alchemist who was serving at the time. Um, there was a country which is a loose corollary to, um, you could probably say that the closest cor corollary is Israel. Um, it is a corollary for Jewish, the Jewish people. Um, and a war is led against these people called the uh, Ishvalan War of Extermination. The Fuhrer orders the entire population to be killed. And Roy Mustang, being a soldier, participated in this. There's only one or two characters who couldn't. Um, Armstrong could not. Armstrong couldn't do it. And uh, I can understand that. But a lot of other people did. And this results in, you know, a horrific event that the country gets away with. A mistress gets away with genocide. There's next to no repercussions. And, uh, I mean, outside of perhaps, you could argue that Scar, another one of the main characters, and Ishvalin um who is somehow skilled in alchemy even though ishvalans literally like it's the remaining ishvalans who mostly live in uh in slums and and ghettos and stuff like that um scar and, and they they swear off alchemy uh alchemy is is not considered good by their culture but this guy uses alchemy somehow and we don't really need to get into all the details but there's a reason for it and he uh, becomes a, a terrorist and starts killing. Um, uh, no, she wasn't Ishvalan. She was um, she was from uh, Lenore, which is a different country. Um, and uh, yeah, the radicalized survivors um, is a big part. And Scar's story, a lot of Scar's story. Oh, oops. I'll unmute. Yeah, sorry about that. Scar's story is very much about processing trauma and processing, um, yes, yeah, Scar got the, the his power from the arm of his brother, which is a little complicated, and yeah. Um, the Scar, Scar is a character you will probably hate at the beginning of the show, and you will probably love by the end of the show. Uh, Scar has a, an unbelievably good arc um, uh, throughout the show, where his character develops pretty extensively, and he has to deal with um uh he has to deal with uh with revenge the co the idea of revenge and his people were literally genocided like down to there was barely any left he almost never there's almost no ishvalan characters you encounter through the show because they're all dead his brother was literally killed it, it is it is really heavy and it manages to discuss revenge without um without judging without like saying that his anger is wrong or that his frustration is wrong at all in fact uh he's really only ever portrayed as totally righteous in wanting to kill everyone and destroy the country um 
And that is really cool because the story talks about how revenge was his desire for revenge was actually standing in the way of him getting a better, a more satisfying outcome. That his desire for revenge, had he acted on it at certain points in the story, would have literally ended, it could have ended the world. And he's not wrong. The show never, never ever condemns him for wanting to kill every last person who helped make that genocide happen. But it shows that there are times where raw revenge can be short-sighted, where leaning in too much to anger or hatred can lead us to completely miss other details that would be more important to achieving our own goals. And Scar learns that story probably the hardest of all of the characters in the show, um, which is super, super amazing. Um, also, uh, and that's a big theme of the show, not allowing one desire or one piece of your, of your emotions to, um, to trump all the others. Um, and by the way, it never, by the way, unlike some other shows, it never does this by, by forgiving the acts of, um, of, of people who committed the genocide, by the way, never. It never tries to portray them as just individuals. The the sympathetic treatment that the the people who were soldiers who carried out this um, get what is a is acknowledgement that they really didn't have much of a of a choice. Um, that they didn't exactly have much of a choice. Um, yes, yeah, he does, he does, um, and. Uh, that they didn't have much of a choice and and uh that they have to live with the consequences of going along with those orders for the rest of their lives um yes yep yep that's true roy mustang is an interesting character and personally i think roy mustang is probably my personal favorite character um roy mustang is a soldier who participated in genocide he did not do it happily, but he did it effectively. And after the war, in addition to uh, swearing to never teach anyone else fire alchemy, um, he, uh, uh, he sets up a very complicated web of allies. Um, uh, you know, a web of allies with the goal of himself taking the pow the role of Fuhrer. You might go, oh shit. Um, hey, see you soon, Martini Peterson. Thanks for being here. Um, which is interesting because that's kind of like a, you kind of might get like a Stalin kind of vibe from that. I get it. He's going to be the good guy who gets the power and does good things with the power. And there you go. Like you would assume a lot of stories would probably go that direction. Um, but what's that? No, no, no. But, but you know what I mean? You know what you like, there's the counterpoint, right? Like, oh, if a, if a quote unquote good guy gets the power, then everything will be okay. That's kind of the Stalin idea. Like, yeah, let's give it all to the guy who's the cult on the color of the team that we like, but he's not like that. He, he want, he knows, or he at least has a theory that very few other people have the ambition and the drive to take over as Fuhrer, to do whatever is necessary to get in that position and not fail when he gets into that position. And as you learn throughout the series, um, you will discover that he makes distinct decisions that make it functionally impossible for him to go back on what he believes. To the point that the person he trusts most in the world, he gives her a direct order to kill him if he ever uses his power irresponsibly or abandons his desire to dismantle the monstrous state that a mistress has built. 
and he almost fails. And he almost gets killed, believe it or not. He he almost fails. Like literally, that's one of the big points in the store, in this in the show. And it's funny because it's really interesting that the the part that they chose for him to have a uh, a check on is seemingly seemingly arbitrary. And at first glance, it's like, oh, well, like, really? You're going to, like, step in here? But he was being tested by the people who trusted him most. And he almost failed. But he didn't. He didn't because, yeah, he almost fails in his fight versus Envy. Envy, who literally murdered his best friend. His best friend in the entire world. Well, maybe not his best friend, but his like his brother, basically. He may as well have been a brother. Maze Hughes was basically his brother. And was murdered in cold blood. And um, he wants to kill Envy. And his friends stop him. And it's like, well, you know, he kind of has, he does, I mean, Envy's horrible. Envy's done a lot of terrible things by this point in the show. But the fact of the matter is, in my opinion, that was not about, it wasn't about Envy. It was about whether Roy would actually keep his promise. Whether he would back down when the check to his power was brought up. And he did. But barely. He barely, barely brings it up. I mean, he, he barely passes it, I should say. But he does. And I like that. Because it talks about the... The oh yeah, and Envy absolutely started it. There was it was it would have been totally I believe it would have been totally just for Roy to be able to kill the fuck out of um of Envy, obviously. And it's never said otherwise. By the way, the show never argues that it wouldn't. Well, because lust, but that's a different situation. Yet yeah, that's what I'm saying. The show isn't talking about whether it was right or wrong to kill somebody who's a mass murderer, like obviously and en killing Envy is would is like yeah obviously the show is talking about power and the difference between roy and father is that roy realizes that well basically absolute power corrupts absolutely and he realizes that he can never allow himself to have absolute power or he will stop being a human. He will stop having, uh, he will stop being able to trust others and, and participate with others. He will become separate from society. And that's something that's really wild about FMAB is there's a lot of talk about what it means to be human. And at least from what I can tell, FMAB seems to think that being human is found in the connections that you have to other humans. Why is the lust situation different? Because he didn't have a personal he didn't have a personal grudge against lust. Lust was just an enemy. Envy was his personal enemy. Killed his best friend. If he stopped then and could stop himself then and could listen to his friends then, his friends know they can trust him anywhere else. Fmab. No, Fmab. That's why it's different. Good night, Adam Flores. Thanks for coming by. Well, it wasn't it isn't about it isn't about envy being disarmed or super weak because lust was weaker. The problem was that it was a personal issue. And the test was from Hawkeye. Literally, it was Hawkeye saying, "This is the moment. I know you want to kill Envy." But I'm telling you, right now, don't do it. That was a test of his power. It was a check as to whether he actually meant it. Because if there's one thing that we can know about Roy Mustang, it's that, um, yeah, that's what it is. It was about identifying whether he was just going to be a, the next fascist. Yes. Yes. That's what it was. And Hawkeye... Now, Hawkeye had listened and trusted Roy Mustang for the entire story. But that in that moment, it was Roy's time. It was time to find out whether Roy could trust Hawkeye. And as it turns out, yes. Yep, he could. 
And I love that, by the way. That's a writing flourish that I loved. And yeah, that's a huge part of the show. Um, God, there's so much to talk about. Let's talk about some of the other things in the show. Um, the Will to Live. You all know I recently did a Bumer, Bloomer Fuel segment. Um, this show really resonated with me strongly because of something I've realized on my own. And the reason why I tell you all to not die is because that is what matters. If you die, you don't get to keep making the world a better place. You don't get to keep kicking. So unfortunately, you have to survive. Sometimes survival means doing some tough things and making some tough decisions and going through some tough motherfucking shit. But, if you, but you need to survive. And that's why I tell people, don't die. And that's why Roy Mustang's order was don't die. Okay? My orders are don't die. Yeah, one of the best moments in the show. It, there's, they're, they're about to go into the big climax of the show. The final chapter of the show is about to begin. And Roy says, listen to me now and heed my order. As your commander, I give you this order. Don't die. That is all. Let us go. And then they go. And I love that line. That ah, fucking one of the most intense moments in the show. It, absolutely incredible. It gives me, literally, I'm getting goosebumps just remembering it. No, I'm not kidding you. Literally, you could actually see the hairs standing up on my fucking arm. Um, because it's so intense. And that's just an amazing moment in the show. Um, <laughs> and uh, duck bumps. Yep, goosebumps. And uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, all the way. Yeah, listen, it's easy to become Doomer. But it's just better to be Bloomer. It is easy to become Doomer, but it's better to be Bloomer. And I say that as somebody who, as you know, as I've talked about on stream many times before, uh, you know, I've been through a lot. Been through a lot of shit. Um, I've, I, you know, and a lot of mental health stuff. This isn't just a general positivity message. It's just a, a philosophical fact. Yep. Roy was very scared. Roy was scared of becoming a fascist. Yes. And that is what it is. It is. The show is about fascism. It is a, a searing critique of fascism. Of fascism of all forms. It is a searing critique of uh, of hierarchy. Um, although it's not, again, it's not like super theoretical. It's not like, ah, yes, you know, Marx once said. No. It's talking about... Um, you know, it's talking about very specifically um, how autocratic power just allows every flaw of an individual to be magnified. And that is illustrated very, very, very well by Father. Father is a character who achieves the ultimate form of power. Literally, at one point, becomes one with God. God. What the fuck? And, but because in the process of doing so, Father uh, severed himself from all of his flaws. Yes. Uh, from Hawkeye? Yes, he did. And then Hawkeye had the last record of the secret of flame alchemy on her back. Um, I'll talk about that after. Um, that's another really major moment too, but that's a moment of trust where Hawkeye and also fun fact, little cool detail in the background when, which thank you to silent for pointing this out. Um, if you look at the, the, the door, the door of truth. Okay. So this is a really cool thing, uh, for an alchemist to s s witness the truth, they have to do there's a whole bunch, there's a whole process of it. And witnessing the truth is a, a traumatic and terrifying event. And the door to truth appears different to every individual. Usually in the show, it, um, it appears as a, uh, a religious symbol. And if you look closely, they all have different ones. So for, um, for Edward, it is the Sephirot. The, the, you know, uh, if you, if you don't know what the Sephirot is here, let me show you. I'll, I'll bring this up. I probably should. The Sephirot. Here you go. Let me, uh, this. It's this. There you go. 
it's this. This is the symbol that he has. It's the uh, it's the the the, the uh, Kabbal Ka Kabbalah tree of life. Um, and when you see uh, Alphonse's door to truth, um, you see Yggdrasil, which is the Norse tree of life. When you see Roy Mustang's door of truth, it's the tattoo that Hawkeye has on her back. The secret text of Flame Alchemy, which he burns out of her back so that no one else can ever learn Flame Alchemy and commit such atrocities again. That's a wild detail. That is a fucking pog-ass detail, if you ask me. It's literally, it may as well be like his god is basically the memory of burning this this tattoo out of his best friend flame alchemy is a is a form of alchemy that is that's focused around fire it's very dangerous to humans causes agonizing death is incredibly powerful and uh Re reza said that she never wanted anyone else to learn the secrets of flame alchemy because it's too fucking bad um and so because she had it tattooed on her back. Oh yes, and the and yes, exactly. Yes, I was about to comment on that silent. And when you see father's, when you see father's door of truth, it's blank. There's nothing on the door of truth for father. He never discovered any truth of any meaningful type. Because all he wanted was the power. And he wanted to take every shortcut he could to get there. Kind of wild. And actually very sad. Uh, the ending of, of Father's character is, is fucking sad. It made me really sad. Yes, there you go, Blue. Flame alchemy allows nearly instant lighting of fire and a huge amount of it. And as it turns out, humans uh, die. Yeah, it did. Yes, it did. But that was even, that was un un unjustly shown. But yes. Uh, father is, is, Father is the dwarf in the flask. Hohenheim is the boy's father. Now let's talk about Hohenheim, shall we? Because some of you will know that I have a little pet theory about Hohenheim. Um, which is going to be fun to talk about. Hohenheim is an egg. Oh shit. That's right. Hohenheim is a trans allegory. Hot take incoming. Hot take. <laughs> Hohenheim. No, Hohenheim isn't Vosh. What? No. I'm going to give you the hot take. An egg. Yeah. If, are you familiar with the term egg? An egg is a trans person who hasn't realized that they're trans yet. And hasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So let me explain how this works. Okay. So. Hohenheim. Now. The thing that immediately struck me with egg vibes from Hohenheim was actually in the visuals. So, um, uh, like, this is not, no, this is a great take. My, my take is, is ironclad. I am so convinced by this take, it's not even funny. So, let me build up to this first. First off, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood has fucking amazing, like, for the time. It's not perfect. Queer representation. There are literally multiple. There's a non-binary main character. Um, there is. Uh, n uh, there is. At least two. Characters who cross dress. One of which. One of whom literally. Just 100% cross dresses. And passes as an old woman. And does it all the time. And no one bats, nobody really bats an eye. Uh, General Grummond, General Grummond has multiple times where he, he dresses up as a, an old woman and goes out to meet people completely secretly. And there's one point where like Roy Mustang is like, what? Like he's surprised, but he never judges, never judges, never, ju there's no judgment passed on Grummond whatsoever. And Grummond is like, 100% comfortable in the role. Which is wild and really cool. There's another character. There is a uh, flamboyantly 
uh, gay man character who increasingly throughout the show dresses more and more, um, more and more feminine. And there's also Envy, who the, the dub uh, uses male pronouns for, but is so obviously non-binary. It's like not even funny. Like it's like painfully non-binary. And like, that was obvious. Like they were just like, yeah, we're doing this. Um, and then there's another character who is once again, also portrayed only positively the owner of the mail shop in, um, the auto mail shop in, I can't remember the name of the town, the auto mail, um, the auto mail, um, town. There's like a town that's known for auto mail. And the owner of the of one of the shops in town is like a flamboyantly gay guy who over the course of the show becomes increasingly like wears increasingly feminine clothes. And I don't know if that character was intended to be trans, but it's definitely a uh, a gender nonconforming representation that's wholly um, uh, uh, po positive. Garfield. Yeah, it might be Garfield. Yeah. Um, and I love that character, by the way. Um, this show also has really phenomenal uh, m masculine representation. Um, Garfield. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't remember their name. Um, there is a... Th so not only is there General Armstrong, you know, who is very, very, very masculine, beautifully masculine. Lo he was. He's like... He loves his muscles and his body. He's like a... Oh, he loves it. But there's another guy. There's a guy. Uh, I can't... I always forget his name. But he is the teacher's wife. Yes, her husband. Yes, that's the one. Izumi's husband. I always forget his name. Yes, we're going to talk about that as well, Dango Bangle. Uh, Sig. Sig. That's his name. Sig. Sig is one of the most, like, non-toxic masculine characters I can ever, I, I can possibly imagine. Like, the dude, literally, like, it almost made me cry. Like, the way that he cares for Izumi is unbelievable. He's a giant, big bear of a man. And guess what? He has a he has a brief bromance with Armstrong. And it's so fucking good. It's so fucking good. They're very different. But they have, like, this moment where they respect each other's masculinity and they support each other. This show is so woke on gender, it's amazing. It's so good it's so fucking it's like galaxy brained when it comes to gender like it totally knows oh cool oh shit oh shit thank you two kings true yep it's the it is the hands clasping meme it's so good it's so fucking good oh oh sick thank you so much i'm gonna put this up right now thank you so much danny i appreciate this i'm gonna put it up spoiler spoiler image so people come in and you, we can we can put this up on the image for when we do the edit. Um, also, Danny, depending on how comfortable you are with it, um, you could add images for the characters and stuff. Um, that'd be awesome. If you want to. I, don't feel pressured to or anything. Um, we can talk about the editing thing. Here we go. Spoiler. Full Metal Alchemist. There we go. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Um, yes. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then also, um, the show talks about... Oh, God, it does so much. But anyway, that was the... That was the... Um, yeah, the furry friends. We'll get, we'll get to that as well. It does have furry representation as well, which is very interesting. Um... So this show is super queer, all right? I'm just calling it right now. Maybe it wouldn't have identified, maybe people wouldn't have identified it that way, but it totally is. This show talks about gender relations all the time. It, 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 it shows, there's like, God, there's even a character. There's um, Madame Christmas. Madame Christmas. Madame Christmas is the owner of a brothel who adopted Roy Mustang. Um, we're going to get there. Uh, who is coded very, very heavily as like an old trans woman. And, and she's amazing. 
She's amazing. You love the fuck out of her. Madame Christmas is amazing. And she's a sex worker. And she's portrayed as a hero. Like through and through. 100%. And I, like, no, she wasn't even sassy. She's like, here, let me show you Madame Christmas. Uh, uh, from Mab. Here we go. She's so cool. Yeah, oh yeah, oh wait, sorry. Her name, her full name is Chris. As in, like, not longer. Chris Mustang. Chris Mass. Like, it's revealed. I didn't even know they outed her in it. I, I didn't even realize that until just now. Here, let me show you. Here she is. She's got, like, look, look. I'm just saying trans-coded. -co very, very, like, very, very trans-coded, okay? And I love her so much. She's amazing. So, let's talk about the next thing. So now I've laid up the, uh, I, I've, I've set up the layup. Now let's see if I can sink the shot. Hohenheim is an egg. Yep. Yeah, so let's talk about Hohenheim being an egg, okay? So the first things that, that got me about it was there was a lot of, um, there was about, no, I'm about to, I'm about to fucking dunk on your head, good faith actor. Watch this shit. Okay, um, Hohenheim, so the first thing that happens with Hohenheim, Hohenheim is a very interesting character to me. Hohenheim is a living philosopher's stone, so to say. Hohenheim, because of, because he befriended, uh, when he was, many, many years ago, Hohenheim was born in a country that in the timeline doesn't exist. Hohenheim is like a thousand years old. And Hohenheim uh basically is given a body he never asked for ever in fact yeah he lives in the kingdom of xerxes and he didn't make a deal with the devil in the flask no he didn't he didn't make a deal it was thrust upon him he was just a servant who was learning alchemy and served the king of xerxes when and the the flask um uh uh, fucked up or or or, or uh, tricked the king of Xerxes into giving all of the souls uh, to the 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 homunc the flask homunculus, um, and the yes father was the so the dwarf homunculus the little the little shadow ball uh, told the king of Xerxes the wrong information to do the ritual to become immortal. And it would require sacrificing all of the lives in Xerxes to make the king immortal. But instead of, he told him to draw it, the rings incorrectly. Instead, it was centered where the the imp, where the, uh, the devil in the flask would be located. And because the devil in the flask can't move, he was being held by Hohenheim. So Hohenheim also received the blessing. And Yes, the imp in the flask, whatever, whatever you want to call it. The imp in the flask. Let's stick with the imp in the flask, flask because that's cute. Um, and it's it's themed. So, um, Hohenheim is given a body full of the souls of thousands of other people from the kingdom. And he never asked for it. He feels incredibly uncomfortable with his body. It is, uh, he... he like it's it's a huge part of his story that he doesn't even belong like he doesn't feel like he belongs anywhere um and uh and he, like literally i mean he he's like 450 years old looks as young as day he when he goes to to when he goes and tries and lives in the in the king in the kingdom of amestris it doesn't make any sense um because like he grew up in like persia basically and like his 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 sensibilities are different he looks different uh you know he doesn't age which is weird he can't really connect with anybody so there's some of there's some of it but there's more because he has a weird relationship with his family so first off the first really weird thing that again trans allegory alarm bell ringing 
he thinks he can't have kids. It's kind of weird because, uh, you know, that's kind of a weird thing, right? That's kind of a trans thing being like, I'm never going to have kids. I'm just ne I'm never going to have kids. It won't happen. And he's very concerned about being a terrible father. He represses his emotions and keeps them incredibly secret to the point that there is only one photo that it was ever even taken of him. And in that photo, he cries because he finally started to feel like he could connect with his family. Other than that, he doesn't appear in photos. He doesn't like being looked at. He likes to avoid other people. He sticks to himself. He wears oversized brown suit that mostly hides his body. He grows his hair out really long and wears it up, which his kids follow. And here's where it gets really weird. Ready? The way in which he interacts with his wife on multiple occasions. Now, this isn't a part of the plot, by the way, but it's written in to the animation. And this is part of what makes me believe it. It's There's a lot of points where the way he looks at and interacts with his wife is... And actually, actually, it is part of the plot, just a little bit different. He envies his wife. He envies his wife because she can die. Not because she's a woman, but it's an allegory. He envies his own wife because she can die. He loves his wife, but he envies her. And trans people, come on, have not, has, is not one of the staples of of the story of being trans is not knowing whether you're in love with someone or you envy them because they have the body you desire. Wait, well, it's a big deal, Dango Bangle. Keep in mind that Hohenheim doesn't, Hohenheim has watched all people that he knew die. Well, and wanting to die. <laughs> Okay, okay. All right, all right, Ella. So that one, throw that one out the window, okay? But it's true. And it goes so far. And guess what? You might be not sold yet, but guess what? It goes further. It goes further. It go I have more evidence. Because there's a specific scene with Hohenheim where Hohenheim returns to the village, okay? Returns to the village that, that his kids grew up in. And he talks to Izumi. And, um, yeah, I'm saying Hohenheim is MTF. I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be. It's, it's either way. Um, Hohenheim ret returns to the village, and he's having a conversation with Izumi. And I think it's Izumi. Wait, was it Izumi in that scene? Silent, remind me. Is it Izumi or is it, is it his wife in that scene? It's his wife, right? Or is it Izumi? I can't remember now. Hold on. I feel like I need to look up the scene now. I, I'm, I'm having a brain fart. Regardless, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it, it's it's framed as if he's having a conversation. Yeah, no, the episode the episode where with the face with the face thing where where the the imp tears off his the face. It's not Granny. No. Um, let me see if I can find it. it oh, I no, not Pinaco. Oh, it was young Pinaco. Is it Granny? Oh, it is young Pinaco. Oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Whatever, it doesn't matter, okay? So he's having a conversation with Pinaco. And um, and this conversation veers off into, you realize it's a dream. So he's having a dream about an event that he was in, right? And in this conversation, in this dream sequence that he's having, where first he's talking to Pinaco, then uh, the the... Uh, the uh, the alternate version of Hohenheim, the other version of the person who looks just like Hohenheim, father, the imp in the flask appears and is shouting at at him and is shouting at Pinaco. And Pinaco responds back to the father, the 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 dwarf or the the imp in the flask and is fighting. And then this is where it gets super trans. Ready? Are you ready? The imp in the flask says stop wearing that mask and he reaches out and he grabs pinaco's face and tears it off and it's hohenheim inside of pinaco's body
and I'm like, hmm, I wonder what they could be talking about here. I really wonder what they could be talking and hinting at here. No, the point is that it's very explicit gender gender fuckery in a in a conversation used that imagery gender fuckery imagery used in a scene where Hohenheim is essentially arguing with himself and the dark side of himself tells him to stop hiding behind the female mask if that is not a struggle with gender dysphoria made into an analogy i don't know what the fuck is your it is literally hohenheim and hohenheim's idealized perfect body which was stolen from him and he takes the role of a, of a of a strong woman arguing against himself only to have his dark psychotic emotionless side tear the mask off and tell him to stop hiding sorry sorry everyone that strong woman who can die true i speak the truth my eyes see have seen the truth when I, when I, when I, when you, when you, when I go and see my door of truth, it's going to be, it's going to have on it, Hohenheim is trans. That's what it's going to, that's what it's going to say on it. When I, when I witness the truth. Ho, oh, ho, look at that. Yes. So there's my case. And by the way, um, there's another part of it too. Ready? Okay. Listen, I'm just going to say, listen, Hohenheim gets blessed with immortality. And the first thing that Hohenheim does is go out into the desert and walk around learning the stories of every single soul that was infused into his body. And I'm just going to say, if massive guilt about your own existence isn't a trans narrative, what the fuck is? You never asked for it. It was nothing that you even had intended. But this body is forced on you. And you have no control over how it unfolds. Except, perhaps, to try and understand it. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an argue for plur plurality representation there as well. There's a couple of characters like that. Greed as well. True, you're finding out the truth. Hey, Copioid Crisis. <gasps> really, you boy, Depoy? Oh, sick. Whoa! Whoa! This is awesome! Imp. <sighs> Holy shit! Ya boy Tapoy, I might need to ask you- I might need to commission you for something. I might need to commission you for something. This is fucking pog as shit. We're gonna talk. Holy shit, that's awesome. That is so fucking awesome. Now, there's a little more I want to discuss about before we finish the FMAB review, um, which is greed. I fucking love greed, okay? Yeah, now that you've seen the truth, you can do alchemy without transmutation circles. Yep, that's right. All you had to do was give up your gender. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, greed. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. Greed. Um, greed is a super, super cool character. Oh, good faith actor. You, you can say that all you want, but I know you're convinced. Sorry. 
Um, Greed is super cool. Greed is the only homunculus who reaches any form of happiness. And it's interesting to me, and I, I, I'd love to look into the philosophy of this, but I can't help but go, oh, wait a minute. Isn't that like, isn't that like Lacan? Isn't like Lacan the philosopher who wrote all about like how desire is like one of the intrinsic parts of what makes us human? Um, but greed, both times that greed is incarnated, his desire leads him to make bonds with other people, to connect with others. He's not very, greed is not very strong by comparison to the other, um, to the other ones, to the other, uh, homunculus. And greed has to be melted down twice. Um, but it's really amazing because greed by sharing, by, by sort of being forced to share a body with Ling, um, ends up realizing, uh, a lot. And it's actually super, super amazing because greed is a is the embodiment of he's literally the embodiment of father's greed separated out into an indiv independent being but greed is able to become whole by the end of the story and greed is able to essentially arguably become human by the end of the story because greed finally realizes that the thing that he wants more than anything is not to be an is not to be the emperor of the world is not to have all of the riches but is to have what he is not supposed to have also that's an interesting message as well right hmm hmm um but yeah what he's not supposed to have which is human connection and he makes human connection and that satisfies him finally he makes human connection by becoming friends with Ling. By becoming, by doing something selfless. It's a wild discussion in, within the show that I think is really profound and, and awesome. Um, human connection is pretty fucking poggers. His greed ended up making him somewhat selfless. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting how it can do, how that works, right? I mean, after all, we all yearn for togetherness. And it is our desire for togetherness that helps us overcome our our own individual desires. We we desire to be together with people. And some people become totally lost in their greed and they wish to possess others. They wish to control others. But that's not a satisfying way to do it. It is only you can only really get what you truly want by recognizing that you have to share it with other people. Not always, not everything, but you have to be able to share and trust and give to other people if you really want to get what most people truly desire, which is connection, togetherness, belonging. Yeah. And of course, all of this takes place in a critique of fascism. It's very hard to ignore. Um, it's very hard to ignore um, the uh, the commentary uh, of all of this messaging. Um, you know, uh, in in the context of an anti-fascist story, which it absolutely is an anti-fascist story. Speaking of which, I would be remiss if I didn't mention. Fuhrer King Bradley. Wow, that's interesting, Sonnenbar. Wait, is it open yet? Is it the open panel yet? Maybe I'll hop in there if it's the open panel. I might. I don't want to be salty. But also, come on, they didn't let me on. Motherfuckers. It is anti-fascist. Fuhrer King Bradley is, uh, well, he's a, he, he's exactly what, he think, what you think he is. He's the Fuhrer. But here's the interesting thing about Fuhrer King Bradley. Fuhrer King Bradley is a puppet. He's driven purely by wrath, but that wrath only has direction because of father. Um, and while it's easy to be, to hate King Bradley, 
uh, c completely. And he kind of deserves it because he is a monster. He's a horrible monster. He's also tragic because you find out at the very end that he doesn't even know why he's angry. He doesn't even know what his wrath is directed for. And he doesn't really care. No, pride was Salim. Pride was Salim. Uh, King, King Bradley. His first name is King, last name Bradley is Wrath. Pride was Salim. And all of these, by the way, all of the characters have their own little, um, have their own little, uh, unique arcs. Um, yeah, King Bradley was a homunculus. Yes, he is a homunculus. Well, he wasn't, I, I mean, okay, well, it's complicated, but yes. Uh, King Bradley is, oh, Bradley was pride instead of wrath. Oh, that's weird. No, uh, Bradley is, in, in the, in FAMAB, Bradley is wrath. And that makes sense to me. Keep in mind, King Bradley is, uh, Fuhrer King Bradley is the one who carried out the, ex the war of extermination on Ishval. Um, and the interesting thing about, the thing that's super interesting about, um, uh, about, um, Fuhrer King Bradley is that, um, is that, uh, he, he, he's, of uh, he's on the surface, super friendly in all of his official interactions. He's like the nicest guy ever. And then he snaps like that. And he's so scary. And I think that's one of the things that makes him, um, really interesting. And I think that they did a good job representing wrath like that. Because it does come out of nowhere sometimes. If you've ever if you've ever met somebody who's succumbed to anger, somebody who's a truly angry individual. I don't know if any of you have ever met that. I have. I have met people who um, are they've basically hollowed themselves out in the name of anger, and that type of person is often very very good at at seeming charming and welcoming, and they turn on a dime when something goes against their plan. And it's pretty scary. They do a good job representing that. Well, Jessica Metal, the good news is you are not Wrath. You are not Bradley. And I do believe that through challenging and learning to control anger, you can become a much stronger person. Oh, of course. It's a great fight scene. But I just, I don't, there's so many other ones. It's really boring. Aw. Are you saying that I made the right choice and all of the people who abandoned my my stream made the wrong choice instead of sticking around and watching the amazing FMAB review? Damn, all of you are Envy right now, lol. Um, but actually, um, Envy is a super interesting character as well. And you find out Envy is the flip side of Greed, by the way. Obviously, it kind of makes sense, right? But Envy, Envy's, Envy com kills themselves. Envy kills themselves at the end because they're so sad that they can't have friends and they're so bitter. Well, yes. We're not we're almost done, Gina. We're almost. Envy literally tears their own heart out because they're so sad that they can't have um friends. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention the brotherhood portion because uh the relationship between edward and alphonse is amazing and wonderful no it wasn't dango bangle it was envy envy tried to make it like saying f you to the gang but um they hated being pitied no they didn't well they the pity hurt because it was the truth it was the truth that killed envy that was the thing. Envy died because of the truth. Because Envy couldn't handle being revealed as no different than greed. Even though Envy saw themselves better. That's what did it. It wasn't it wasn't just the pity. It was that they that they got figured out it was that at the end of the day all they really wanted all they really wanted was to make friends, and they couldn't. They simply couldn't. They just simply couldn't. So, 
Yeah, it is. And then, of course, the relationship between um, Edward and, and Alphonse, which is um, wonderful and aspirational. Um, but it's it's tough, you know. Like um, nobody, you know, you don't you don't really get to. And also, oh, that's another thing. Found family is a huge part of. Um, why couldn't they make friends? No, because they couldn't admit it. Because they because they couldn't overcome their flaws. That's the difference between greed and envy. Envy and greed functionally want the exact same thing. If you notice, greed wanted friends, envy wanted friends. The difference, greed figured out how to overcome his own weaknesses. He had to give up. He had to give up something of his own. Lust also wanted to not be seen as a sex object. I don't remember that part, actually. But that's interesting. Um, found family is a huge part. <laughs> sloth, sloth is well. Sloth and gluttony are the are like sloth, gluttony, and and lust are like the weakest of the, of the um. Of the of the character flaws of the sins, they're the weakest of the character flaws, and likewise, they're the easiest to overcome. Um. Yeah, he ceased to be greedy. Yes. It was touched on just before she died. Sloth overworked himself. I mean, kind of. I, I feel like, well, those characters. Oh, that's cool. I, I got to watch the O3 FMA. I'm sure it'll, I'm sure it's great. Um, I'm sure it's really great. I'll, I'd love to watch it at some point. Um, yeah, Lust, Lust and FMAB was a minor character, but I don't see that as necessarily a flaw because, I mean, I think that like, um, yeah, like, I mean, the, there are the, the, there seems to be in FMAB a greater and lesser, uh, sins. There are sort of greater and lesser sins. Gluttony, um, is, you know, the desire to always consume and you can overcome that and perhaps easier. I don't know. Does pride have anything interesting? Of course. Pride is super, super interesting. But, uh, you know, part of the problem of pride, you know, is that pride believed themselves to be the greatest of all of them. The first, the greatest of all of the sins. And literally consumed other other ones regularly. And in fact, uh, it, was, uh, it was that, like, the consumption of the other ones that ended up leading to pride's downfall. Yeah, pride literally ate gluttony. Um, yeah, I could go into that. I just think it's a little bit less, um, yeah. Yeah, pride's true form was a tiny baby. A tiny, tiny baby. A tiny, pure baby. Also, uh, just so you know, uh, tr true form envy is cute as fuck. So cute. Tiny lizard. Tiny lizard. So cute. Squishy, squishy. I want I want a stuffed animal of, pr of, of true form envy. Yeah, they did. They put a little dot on his head. Yeah, true form greed is just like a weird, like, angry looking sprite. Looks like the very nice face. Very nice. Um... Yeah. Okay. I think that's everything. I think that's everything I have to say about FMAB. Go watch FMAB. It's really amazing. I hope you enjoyed my hot takes and I hope you'll enjoy the final version of this. Don't forget to like and subscribe because uh, I do cool shit like this all the time. I also talk about politics and do debate. It's cool as fuck. So. Disability representation. Obviously. Holy shit. Guys, FMA is like half of the characters in FMA are missing limbs and have to learn how to cope with that. Like, all of the characters are either scarred or missing a limb or missing their entire body. And it's a big part of the story. In FMAB, there are multiple parts in the story where the small intricacies of dealing with a, with a setback or something along those lines like that is... Um, it, sorry, Benjamin. It's almost over. Uh, this is not a big spoiler part, okay? This, there's no spoilers in this part. Um, in FMAB, like, a lot of the characters deal with this and 
in fact, the main characters deal with this pretty extensively. The 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 way that the that society isn't necessarily designed for them, the way they have to overcome these setbacks, and no one like disabled people in in the FMAB world are never looked down upon. Um, in fact, it is seen as essential as as almost essential to understanding the truth. Um, that eventually your body is going to quote unquote fail you. Um, that, that your body, that there is no such thing as a perfect body, that all humans at some point encounter, uh, all humans eventually become disabled. That is the basic message. And it is true. Humans, our bodies are fallible. Eventually we will age. Eventually we will get sick. Eventually we might lose, uh, and, 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 uh, you know, an, uh, an arm or a leg. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Staring blankly ahead, they do. Um, I think. Yeah, wait. Let me think. I'm pretty sure they do. I can't think I can't think off the top of my head. What about Nina? Nina? Wait, Nina's the um Nina's the wait. Yes, they do. Oh yeah, they have automail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, they do, yes. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, yeah, it might mostly be trauma. But I don't know that it impacts the message all that much. Anyway, that was the addendum. There's the addendum. Yeah, that's what I thought. Shao Tucker's daughter. Uh, oh, I, yeah. You know what's bullshit? I, it's bullshit that Scar killed her. Anyway, that's the end. That's the end of the review. Thank you for being here. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll talk more. There's, I could go on all day. I got to stop the review somewhere. Maybe we'll talk about it more in the future. But for now, that concludes Demon Mama's Full Metal Alchemist review. And I hope you enjoyed it.